In this video, we'll introduce Coax, which is a Python package for reinforcement learning. Um, and the goal is to make it easy to turn RL papers into code. Uh, so why did we build Coax? Well, uh, first of all, the target audience is RL researchers and practitioners. Um, and we wanted to make it easy to turn papers into code because we wanted to be able to do quick uh, iterations on our experiments and basically to try and uh, sort of hot swap different components uh, and to try out different uh, kinds of agents. Um, and I don't know about you, but if I uh, see a talk about a software package and I don't see any code, I get a bit frustrated. So uh, I thought I'd just sort of change it around, show some code. Uh, not that you need to understand any of it, uh, so it's it's quite a lot, but um, don't read it. The goal of showing you this code is to show uh, the general structure. So the structure on the left is the same as the structure on the right, and that's important to note here because um, the idea is, uh, is to take uh, some pseudocode from a paper and then turn them into a working code that reads almost the same as the pseudocode. So it, it really, so the, the, the structure here is, it, well, the idea is to show that um, the amount of complexity that you see on the left, which is the pseudo algorithm or the pseudo code for, uh, for the DQN agent, that that, that structure, the complexity is, uh, is equal to the uh, structure and complexity uh, on the right. Um, now, uh, Coax has a slightly different design from other uh, RL frameworks, and um, we'll just highlight two. Um, one is the, the neural network architecture, and the other one is uh, how we deal with a training loop. Um, so the neural network architecture is a first-class citizen in, in Coax. And uh, here's an example of the actual Q function that we use to play Atari video games. Um, so it's just a, a couple of uh, convolutions and uh, and then some fully connected layers, um, and you see it's just fully fully uh, transparent what's going on here. So we basically just define the forward pass function called func here, um, and then the Q function uh, just takes that forward pass function and turns it into uh, uh, something that we can actually use as a Q function. So. Um, so for instance, here we, uh, we define this Q function and uh, as an example, we'll just take a state action pair and then feed it into this Q function and you just get a floating point uh, if you give it a pair. And also if the action space is discrete, you can omit the, uh, the actions as well. Um, and in another part of where to sort of emphasize how you're in control is that um, some in some packages, it can be very difficult to figure out exactly what is uh, running and where it's running and and uh, what's exactly happening and and in Coax we just got away with uh, we did away with all of that, um, so here we just so the the user is in control of uh, of of saying exactly when and and how the function approximators are updated. Um, so Coax is built around concepts uh, like value functions and policies and that sort of thing, but, but not around agents. So it has a notion of an agent, but it's basically uh, uh, like other packages are centered around agents where I think it just doesn't really quite work because it's too high level. Just to illustrate this point on the left here, you see the implementation of a DQN agent uh, as, uh, as done in TF agents. Um, where you just see a whole bunch of um, uh, arguments and flags that you need to set, but it's not very clear from the context of, of the code what those flags do. So you have to basically go back to the paper and try and figure out what is going on. And uh, the goal of Coax is to not really have to read back, that you can actually read the code and understand what it does. Uh, and on the right, it's even even worse. It's uh, RLib. It's, um, uh, RLib is, is sort of centered around configuration files, which is useful if you want to do big parameter sweeps, but it's very painful if you want to implement your own agent. So it, it, uh, it's, it, it's very quickly, it becomes very hard to, uh, to debug. Um, so because Coax gets rid of this idea of an agent, um, we do want to sort of fill that gap by implementing, uh, showing how to implement certain agents in Coax. Um, and uh, so we we offer these uh, these things called stubs or agent stubs, which are just a sort of a, a, a very simple skeleton for building a, an agent. And you can just copy it and and uh, just put in the specific environment that you're interested in, and and that's your agent. So under the hood, this uses uh, JAX and XLA. Um, XLA is um, a hardware acceleration for linear algebra operations. So basically. 
quick operations on TPUs and GPUs. Um, and JAX um, is a way to uh, basically, it has an alternative implementation of NumPy um, that also has uh, automatic differentiation uh, and is written on top of XLA, which makes it uh, very fast and also automatically differentiable. So it's a very lightweight version of uh, or alternative to uh, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch. Um, so it's it's fast and it's flexible. It's uh, and and everything is is very explicit. So it's it's a very nice package to work with. So let me now go. Uh, so now that I've introduced the package, let me just quickly uh, give a little example of how to build an agent. In this demo, we'll get to see how to get started with Coax. Um, the the environment that we'll solve is, a, is not very complicated. In fact, it's the easiest one that I could find. And the reason is that um, I wanted to focus on uh, the components of Coax more than the, uh, the specific details of, of an environment. So um, the frozen lake, in fact, we'll, we'll take the non-slippery version of the frozen lake. Uh, which is just a four by four grid. Uh, you start at the top left and you sort of work your way to the bottom right. At least that's the goal. Um, and uh, we're going to do uh, reinforcement learning to, uh, uh, to make that happen. Um, obviously, it's not very impressive because it's not all that complicated of a task, but uh, we'll see that the exact same uh, techniques also work on much more uh, sophisticated environments. And uh, in the documentation, you find uh, other examples of more sophisticated agents and uh, more intricate uh, kind of uh, tasks. Um, but uh, for now, we'll just focus on a very simple one to keep it simple and brief. Uh, so we'll start by importing the packages that we need. That's Jim, uh, so it's Jax for our arrays. It's uh, Haiku for our uh, neural networks and it's optics for our uh, optimization. And then of course, Cox itself. We start by defining our environment, uh, which we define, which is called the frozen lake non-slippery. Um, and then uh, just we'll just have a, a quick look at the observation space and the action space. So the uh, observation space is, uh, is a four by four grid, which is represented by uh, just an integer and the action space as well. So we've got up, down, left, right. Um, so we'll start the actual um, episode rollout loop by uh, starting with our initial state from the reset. And then for uh, time step T in the maximum episode steps, um, we'll just run our uh, rollout. So we uh, sample an action for now because we don't really have a policy to sample from. Um, and then we'll take one step in the MDP and uh, here is where we normally would uh, do our updates. Uh, we don't do it right now. Uh, so, and then we break out of the loop if we're done. Um, now we can run this, but obviously it doesn't do anything. So let's render. And indeed we see that it's, uh, the agent sort of walks straight into a hole. Um, right, so the next step is to try and figure out um, what to basically build a queue function that we can use to select actions. So uh, the queue function will use the queue class uh, for which we uh, will we'll feed in a forward pass function um, and the environment, which is used to check the, the input and output structure of the forward pass function. So the forward pass function we define as our state action pair and uh, a flag that says whether we're training or not. Um, and we have two options when the action space is discrete, which is to either feed in a state action pair and output a scalar or take a state action uh, or to just take a state and then output a vector uh, where each entry of the vector is, is, uh, is the value associated with an output action. Um, so that's what we'll do here actually. Um, so we'll take, we'll remove the, uh, the input A um, and then we'll, we'll output the vector. So uh, let's just drop this. Um, Drop this A, right, sorry. Um, uh, and then we output the number of actions. Um, and uh, obviously we need to also initialize this as zero just to give a, a, a fair sort of entry point to the, to the learning process. Um, so we can evaluate the queue function on the state action pair. And if the action space is discrete, we can also just omit the action altogether. So that's nice. 
Um, to go from a queue val a function to a policy, we can take uh, either a, a Epsilon Greedy or a Boltzmann policy, so a value-based policy. And um, I personally prefer a Boltzmann policy because it's a little less finicky. Um, and here we can just uh, uh, feed the state into, uh, into the policy and it's, uh, it's a probabilistic function. So you see that it has different uh, outputs. So now we can replace the random sampling by uh, the sampling done by the policy, which is still random. So we'll still actually end up in a hole here. Um, but other than that, it, uh, it works just, uh, just the same. So what we're going to do now is, is define how we're going to update this Q function. So we'll take the Q learning uh, algorithm from the TD learning module. Um, and uh, one of the things to note here is that the update uh, method that we'll use uh, requires a transition batch and uh, we don't have that yet. So we need to define uh, a way to do that. So we'll uh, define a tracer, which is uh, just a simple end step tracer. Um, and the end step tracer will just take a single step, a TD step, and uh, we'll take a discount factor of 0.9. Um, and then what we can do is we can actually start, uh, uh, start do it running our update. So the first thing that we can do is, um, is we can just f take a raw transition and then feed it into the uh, NSTEP tracer. And the NSTEP tracer will evaluate the true if it has something to pop, if you can pop a transition from it. So that's what we'll do here. And then that transition, we then feed back into the Q-learning algorithm. Uh, so that's how we do our updates. And, um, and then we're, we're basically done, except that of course, uh, we don't want to render at every step because uh, if we're going to take uh, many steps, namely it will take uh, about 500 episodes. Um, and then we can uh, run, uh, in fact, so uh, we're not really seeing any logs here and uh, Cox does have a nice uh, train monitor um, wrapper that we can use to uh, to actually display the, the logs. So we may want to restart real quick and then uh, start running it. And then you'll see that uh, here we actually see in the standard error of the uh, uh, of the cell that, uh, that we're actually learning. And we see the um, uh, average G go up slightly. So finally, you'll finish off by um, actually rendering the episode with the policy, well, not just the policy, but the greedy policy, uh, which is the mode. And indeed, we see that it ends to the goal state. All right, so that was a really quick uh, walkthrough of uh, how to put the different pieces of Cokes together. Um, if you want to look at different examples, just have a look at uh, all of the examples here uh, listed. So, um, so for instance, here are the Atari games. There's a couple of agents on there. So maybe if you want to see PPO run on Atari, uh, here's a nice little script that shows you exactly how to do that. So it's the same same structure, but uh, a few more components. So here is an actor critic. So you have an updater for your actor as well as for your critic. So that's, that's the same kind of thing, but all right. Um, well, thanks for watching and uh, have fun with Cokes. <laughs>